Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Trends Impacting the Transportation and Logistics Industry. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And Mark, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thanks, Emily. Hey, everybody. This is Mark Meyer. I'm Moss Adams Transportation and Logistics National Practice Leader. I just wanted to take two seconds as we look at the agenda here and Thank everyone for, for joining the webcast today. Our team uh, has put together some great content to deliver to you guys. Uh, just a reminder, um, all of our presenter contact info is going to be provided at the end. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chet Wales. Uh, he's a partner with Moss Adams uh, Capital. Hi. Thank you, Mark, and welcome, everybody. Uh, we are uh, excited to talk about uh, all of the trends that we see evolving in the transportation industry. I think it would be appropriate to mention how we view that. So uh, when we talk about the logistics um, and transportation area, we're talking about all the different modes, trucking, marine, rail, and air. We're talking about the warehousing, the handling, the transferring, the information management and freight forwarding and all the things that are involved in getting a product from its origination to its ultimate destination. Uh, today, the, the logistics change is, chain is rapidly evolving. I think uh, all of you on this call are experiencing that. Truckload has traditionally been the focus uh, for a lot of transportation logistics, but it's much more than that. And the transportation management systems include uh, many other categories, as I defined. And we're going to talk about a few of those that, in particular, are changing and are important for all of us. Uh, the last mile is an area that we are going to be uh, talking a fair amount about. It is rising in its importance. Uh, we're going to be talking briefly about uh, technology as it's applied, digitalization, the cloud and the apps and how they are shaping logistics. And uh, by the end of this uh, webcast, we are going to give you some specific actions that you can take uh, right now, uh, one of which is to 
be prepared for the environment, which is uh, encountering an awful lot of consolidation. There's a lot of investors, strategic and financial, uh, and you'll hear from our cybersecurity folks, uh, our revenue rec folks, and there's going to be some things that you can do, actions you can take right now. Uh, let's talk first about uh, the last mile delivery. Uh, the last mile of delivery is uh, very fragmented in today's market. It's a segment that is due for consolidation. Uh, the number of direct-to-consumer shipments is surging. Uh, you on this call probably recognize the number of Amazon boxes stacking up in your garage, uh, the Amazon effect. And customers across uh, all of the different retailers and all the different e-tailers in the United States are expecting uh, two-day delivery. Uh, E-commerce is unstoppable. Uh, and as it grows, uh, there's a shift towards buying even larger, heavier, bulkier items online. So you can imagine furniture, and people are expecting two-day delivery at the last mile for furniture. Um, as fragmented as that space is, uh, it creates an opportunity. As an example, uh, there's a large public company called XPO. Uh, it is probably the largest in the United States for delivery of heavy goods, but even as the largest, it has only 7% share of this space. So that is an indicator to us of how fragmented that is. Uh, another example of the last mile is uh, what Amazon is doing. Amazon is creating its own entrepreneurial force. Uh, it has made offers to anyone that has ambitions to run their own company. Uh, to allow them to establish their own delivery program. And Amazon will give them leased vans, provide technology, provide training, discounts for a variety of services. And the model that Amazon is using is that if you uh, have these aspirations, that you can end up with 40 vehicles, vans, if you will, delivering on the last mile, and you'll make 300000 in profit per year and you can create and run your own business. So this is Amazon's own method of uh, of addressing the last mile delivery. So, so in our whole logistics chain, when we talk about truckload and intermodal and warehouses, this last mile is surging. And this is a very important trend for all of us to pay attention to. Um, the, uh, the next area that I want to talk to is uh, the consolidation that is going on among all parts of the market. Typically, we have been looking at truckload uh, as an area where there's been consolidation. Well, the truckload carriers have largely consolidated. Uh, but I'm going to give some quick examples from the Western region, and I think most of the folks on this call are from that region. But just an example of deals that have happened in the past two months. Um, so last week it was announced that there's a company called SK Capital. Uh, it owns Perimeter Solutions, which has a series of transportation and logistics companies. They bought a company called HS Transport based in Post Falls, Idaho, that provides heavy haul transportation. Uh, the week before that, uh, a large strategic investor, Republic Services, announced the acquisition of bend recycling and disposal, which is a series of heavy haul uh, trucking and recycling and warehousing. Um, the week before that, Lineage Logistics, which owns a variety of cold storage warehouses throughout the West Coast, California, Oregon, and Washington, announced that it has acquired Preferred Freezer Services, which is the next largest national company of cold storage warehouses, Consolidation. Um, both of those companies happen to be owned by private equity groups that have been active participants in this segment. Uh, the week before that, uh, another very large strategic called Upper Bay Infrastructure 
announced that it's acquiring Tidewater Transportation. So Tidewater is the barge transportation and terminal operator that runs um, transportation up and down the Columbia River, and it's based in Vancouver, Washington. Um, and prior to that, this is my last example, uh, the week prior to that, this is a freight forwarding and information technology company, NFI, which is a national strategic, acquired a company in Seattle called SCR. So through these examples, you can see that transportation is set up uh, for an awful lot of consolidation, and what this means is disruption. And that's the uh, the next thought that we have is that transportation logistics needs to be thought of as a technology-based business, and everyone in the supply chain will be a technologist. Uh, and there's a a key takeaway for any industry, but it's particularly true for this one that that great technology in the hands of our well-trained employees is the ultimate competitive advantage. And so when we're thinking of our employees, we have to start thinking in terms of their facility with technology and their ability to, to make great use of the technology. Uh, increasingly, smart data management's playing a crucial role in all parts of the logistics chain. And when we think about the number of drivers, 1.6 million drivers that are moving 70% of the freight in the U.S. There's 10 million trucks on the road, large and small, uh, truckload all the way down to last mile. 10 million trucks, 1.6 million drivers, 70% of the total freight. It's all becoming digitized, being tracked by technology. Uh, consumers are starting to be involved in their own delivery. If you think about you order something, you can track where your product is from the moment it is shipped until it gets delivered. So technology for each of our businesses, everyone on this call, is going to be transformative. The next trend that we see is, is that the technology alone is not going to be the only disruptive part of the business. The, our industry is wide open for disruptive thinking, and, and the example I like to use is Tesla. Tesla is well down the path at creating an all-electric, battery-powered Class 8 semi, and there's a little picture of it. It actually exists. They are test driving it now. They expect to be on the road in a pre-production mode this year, 2019, and go into production by next year, 2020, with with uh, semis. And there's a thought that this will help address the driver shortage, which is a, a key factor that uh, I'm going to talk about it when we get to the macro factors here. Uh, so disruptive thinking is coming into the transportation logistics area. Uh, this is an example. Um, this will have a driver in it, but there's even autonomous uh, semis and autonomous trucks that are on the dry, on the uh, drawing board, it will affect all parts of our industry. Uh, the next point is just an important one for us to remember. We have heard about the driver shortage, and this, this trend has been going on. It's been well talked about. Uh, but a month ago, there was a casualty to this, uh, and it's worth mentioning in this webcast because it's an important trend. Privately held New England motor freight called NEMF, that's that's a very large, less than truckload carrier. Show a couple pictures there. You can see the map that shows the area that they covered. This is a very large company and very substantial part of the transportation network there, and it has shuttered. It's gone into bankruptcy because of the driver shortage and the severity of trying to keep qualified drivers in the seats uh, sufficient to keep the company profitable. Driver shortage is real, and this is just an example of companies are not too big to fail. Even if they have an established network, this company was 100 years old, 
and they're facing disruption. So that's the takeaway there. Uh, those are some quick trends. We're happy to take questions later. Uh, I see that we're up to a polling question here. I'm going to let Emily pick it up. All right, thank you. Our first polling question, in 2019, in which of the following areas will you invest? And your options are technology, employees, infrastructure, acquisitions, or I don't know. And I'll give everyone a few moments to respond. To participate in our polls today, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. A few more seconds. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we are changing subjects slightly. Uh, I'm going to cover some of the macroeconomic factors that affect our industry uh, and then look at some of the valuations and the merger and acquisition landscape. Uh, for spring of this year, consumer confidence, uh, again, is still at a very high level, uh, which is favorable. Uh, trucking tonnage is experiencing uh, gains, modest gains. Uh, the activity in mergers and acquisitions is about flat with last year, given what's happened in the last uh, two months. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, but the most important factor affecting the economic and the macro forecast is this chart at the bottom of the page, which shows the truck driver shortage is forecast to continue to grow. So if you imagine, on the one hand, our economy that is demanding more and more delivery, uh, including the last mile, and we're considering what's required with those 10 million trucks, those 1.6 million drivers, it's hard to replace them. The aging demographics among the current drivers has led to shortages. Uh, the costs are going up, operating costs and delays in the system. Uh, and this is something widely written about. It affects all of us. Uh, there are some people that think as we move to autonomous and electric vehicles and more technology, uh, these jobs and these positions will become more appealing uh, to an up-and-coming group of um, workers and employees. But it is probably the overriding uh, macro factor is this shortage, and it's just one to be aware of. Uh, aside from driver shortage, uh, the amount of tonnage continues to go up on a long-term basis, uh, there's a couple quarters where it comes down and then it seems to go back up again. The manufacturing indexes are favorable. Uh, unfortunately, fuel prices continue to be up uh, a bit. They're settling, but they look like they're going back up again. Uh, on balance, the macro factors are favorable. Um, turning to valuations, uh, the chart you see in front of you tracks different segments of uh, publicly traded stocks. Uh, the railroad companies is the green line that you see at the top. Uh, the value of railroad companies has exceeded the standard and poor's and it has exceeded the value of other segments during the past year. The, the turquoise blue line you see in the middle is the standard and poor's index and then uh, just below that, what you're looking at is a series of other parts of the transportation logistics system, trucking, expedited, and air index. We have a logistics index, so they've settled just a bit uh, compared to the S&P. But we look a little more closely at uh, the valuations here to give you a sense of where the values are. Uh, there's a lot of data on this page. Uh, the third column from the last is the one that we like to look at the most, which is uh, the enterprise value multiple. That's the value of a company uh, compared to TTM, the trailing 12-month uh, EBITDA. That's your earnings. And I think most of the folks on this call have heard that expression a lot. 
But if you take that column and you go down to the bottom, trucking companies on average are uh, valued at about 6.5 uh, times their EBITDA and their earnings. Uh, let's compare that to railroad companies, which is the next slide you see in front of you. Railroad companies are valued using that same metric at about 10.8 10 times their EBITDA. So think, trucking companies at about 6.5, railroad companies at about 10.8. Uh, below that, there's uh, three companies that we put into our expedited and air index. Uh, you'll see that's United Parcel, FedEx, and Atlas Worldwide. Atlas actually serves a number of Amazon uh, needs. The the valuations in this category are in between trucking and rail. They're about seven to nine times uh, earnings measured by EBITDA. And logistics companies, uh, many of which are more informationally oriented, uh, they're trading at about 10 times their EBITDA. So on balance, we could say that the entire transportation system has valuations in around the eight, eight and a half times EBITDA range, which is the very, very bottom box there. But we look at segments, and you can see that different segments have different kinds of valuations. And uh, these valuations are what is often driving much of the merger and acquisition activity. Uh, there's a lot of interest from private investors and public in these categories. So I uh, see that we're up to another polling question here. Emily, I'll let you take it. Okay. Uh, our second polling question, what are the main drivers impacting the economy? And your options are fuel prices, truck driver shortage, consumer confidence, all of the above, or I don't know. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. I'll give everybody a few more seconds here. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Jet, back to you. Thank you. And uh, that is uh, what I was going to cover as it relates to the trends and some of the macro factors, some of the merger and acquisition evaluation factors. Uh, the takeaway that I'd like everyone to uh, consider is that we're in an environment where uh, transactions and opportunities happen at unexpected moments. Uh, we may think that we can plan, but I think all of us on this call realize that opportunities present themselves at unexpected times and being prepared creates value. And uh, we at Moss Adams have learned with many, many companies through the transportation logistics area that being prepared uh, is something that you can do whether or not you want to engage in a transaction. It's worth thinking about the things that you can do uh, to be prepared and be ready. And you could call any of us at the end of the call. Uh, the next subject is very important. You'll recall the transporta the, the uh, excuse me, transformative technology that is starting to take over the industry. Well, along with that comes the question of cybersecurity. And Mark Edwards, uh, who is our specialist in this category, I think has some very valuable points and takeaways for everybody here. So I will turn it over to Mark right now, and thank you. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Mark Edwards. Um, for the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to cover cybersecurity. We're going to, I'm going to brief you on some of the, uh, the largest breaches that have occurred, how much data is really being lost, and then I'm going to zero in on transportation and logistics uh, specifically, and then some common sense uh, preventative measures you can take, everyone can take, to help reduce the likelihood of a cyber breach occurring to your particular businesses. So if we go ahead and we um, look at some of the largest breaches that have occurred in the 21st century, if you notice uh, they, they're in chronological order, uh, we're going to go back to 2011 uh, with the RSA security breach, but we'll start at the top here. So the most recent 
um, that occurred last year was Marriott. <clears throat> and, uh, and as I go through this, I will actually raise my hand and let you know which ones I was a part of. Um, it's 7 of 11. I'll go ahead and, and tip you off, which is very concerning to me as it is really my sole responsibility to work with businesses to ensure that this does not happen, that data is not exfiltrated, um, that ransomware doesn't shut down their business, that credit cards aren't lost or stolen. Uh, so it's very uncomfortable, you know, when I look at this list, and these are all big names, of course, and there are hundreds, actually thousands of others that don't even make these lists just because they simply don't qualify as the largest. So that all being said, Marriott um, looks like it was about 383 million accounts uh, that were breached, and this is if you stated a Marriott or an SPG, actually, specifically, which is more the Sheraton brands, uh, your account information and password was leaked. Uh, so, you know, very, very harmful, unfortunately, and we all received the email saying, hey, change your, your password. Uh, Equifax impacted every single American, uh, 143 that actually has any kind of credit file. Um, so this was very, very um, painful because uh, your credit reports have things such as your social security number, your home address, uh, your mortgages, your credit cards. It, 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 it has a tremendous amount of highly sensitive information that could then wind up leading to credit fraud and other types of, you know, uh, malfeasance that could occur. So that was a big breach, could have been prevented. Uh, adult Friend Finder, $412 million. Um, that's quite a few records, and I'm sure the folks that were a part of that um, weren't too happy about their records being uh, leaked out there as well. Uh, Anthem, yep, I was a part of that. I used to have um, Blue Shield that was owned by Anthem, so my health records are out there. And one would ask the question, well, why should we worry about health, health records? Um, the reality is, is that health records actually are right now commanding the highest price on the dark web and the deep web. So um, just real quick, the Internet as we know it, the Internet that you're using to actually even view this webinar is the publicly accessible part of the Internet. It represents about 10%. The other 90% is, is, is unknown to the majority of, of us. Um, however, that's where the criminal activity occurs, where they, they sell goods and um, you know, they trade secrets, um, they, they have different types of tools, and so on the dark web, um, uh, that's where, you know, that is, and they're exchanging health records um, for about $50 each, so health records are actually very important. Uh, eBay, I was not a part of that, but 145 records. J.P. Morgan Chase, um, yep, part of that, and that was a real wake-up call because the banks in 2014 for J.P. Morgan. The banks in particular, banking industry, spends a, a an ex I don't want to say excessive, but a much more higher than average uh, dollar value on cybersecurity specifically. And it would make sense because the, the cyber criminals are trying to compromise uh, large institutions where, you know, large amounts of dollars are stored by individuals. Um, so the J.P. Morgans, the Bank of Americas, uh, they're all under attack and they spend uh, more money than average. And um, in 2014, 76 million accounts were compromised. And by the way, uh, just as a point of reference, when they were compromised in 2014, J.P. Morgan Chase had 500 dedicated cybersecurity engineers, architects, analysts, and experts, 500. And after that breach, they doubled it to 1,000. So I don't know what the number is today, but just to give you an idea how much energy and how many resources and how many dollars they throw into protecting um, these big banks. Home Depot was a credit card breach. Um, I was a part of that. Yahoo was uh, predominantly, uh, was an email breach, obviously, but your email account as well as your password uh, was taken. And I want to say something about that. So when, when an email is, is compromised, like in the Yahoo, 2 billion records, uh, oftentimes the, the Yahoos of the world and the Googles, they don't encrypt the passwords, they actually hash it, which is a lower level of trying to obfuscate or trying to, you know, conceal what the actual digits are. But unfortunately, there's so many great hacking tools out there that even a hashed password can be reverse engineered and, and figured out. Um, so um, for those of you that had Yahoo back in 2013, you probably wound up getting an email saying you'll get some free credit monitoring and please immediately, you know, change your password. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Target stores with a credit card breach. 
uh, the CEO and the CISO lost their jobs, I think the CIO as well. And then the last two here are more defense related, but the Office of Personnel Management, anyone that's held a security clearance, uh, myself included, I used to be in the defense industry many years ago, um, highly sensitive, because this is um, the Form 86, as they call it, which has fingerprints, it's got everything and everything imaginable about individuals in order to get cleared for security clearances. And that was a nation state responsible for that. Very, very painful. And um, it's not related to transportation and logistics, but nonetheless, that was, a, that was a big loss. And then finally, RSA security, which wound up leading to a whole bunch of downstream breaches in the defense industry, which is something I talked about last week on a different webinar. But if we look to the right-hand side, just to put things into perspective, in the first half of 2018, and I don't have the final numbers yet, but in the first half, at least 4.5 billion records were exposed. Four and a half billion. That represents 60% of the Earth's population. In 2019 already, and these numbers were valid as of early March, um, I was able to find that 2.7 billion records were posted for sale in the dark web. I had mentioned what the dark web is. And of those 2.7, 774 million of those were unique email addresses. That's twice of the U.S.'s population. 21 million unique passwords. And I believe this will be downloadable, this presentation, but if you want to jot this down, um, www.haveibeenpawned.com. Um, it's a free website. Punch in your personal emails as well as your work emails, and you may be surprised how many of your emails have already been compromised and are sitting in the dark web. So again, for me personally, uh, three of my four personal emails uh, have been compromised. And then one more quick tip. Um, never use the same password for all of your emails. I'll say that again because it's really important. Never use the same e the password, pardon me, for all of your emails. Reason being is if one is compromised, then the threat actors will pivot quickly to all of your others. This includes your work email as well. If we go ahead and jump to the next slide, so how much data really is being lost? Just to put this into perspective, so there's about four million records a day, a day turns out to 2,800 every minute and about 46 every second. Now, these are records. That means these are individual records, individual um, individuals who have their data lost or stolen. And essentially, a lot of this ends up on the dark web and it's for sale. And, you know, threat actors are, are very crafty at trying to um, pinpoint individuals. So, you know, if the email for a a college student is lost, for example, that may not be quite as attractive as an email for a CEO of a company or in particular a CFO of a company because um, then you can begin to build some phishing email attacks and some other social engineering attacks, which then turn into some cri criminal activity. Um, and we'll get to that in just a moment as well. So in the amount of time that I've been speaking to this slide, probably 3,000 records have already been uh, lost or stolen. And if you look at 4 million a day, that takes about three months or one quarter for the equivalent population of the entire United States uh, to be lost or stolen. So it is a profound problem, you know, unfortunately. And again, if you check that website, um, you may find out that some of your emails have been compromised. Okay, so let's talk about what are the main threats. Let's start zeroing in now on transportation and logistics. So there's a lot of threats out there. And by the way, just for some terminology here, a threat is, is someone who wants to do harm to your business. So there's got to be threats. And then within your business, there are almost always vulnerabilities. There has to be. It, it really is impossible to have a zero vulnerability environment or, or a business. It's just impossible. But the trick is to reduce that risk down to an acceptable level. And some businesses have much higher thresholds for risk than others. Uh, with the advent of cybersecurity, that's one way to transfer your risk. Um, but I've heard plenty of stories with clients who have been breached. Cybersecurity picked up some of it, but it still does not compensate for the, all of the costs, the reputation costs, lost business, um, lack of confidence with your, with your clients, so on and so forth. Uh, the biggest threat in transportation logistics is really ransomware. And Ransomware, we've all heard of it, and quite simply, it's an attempt to extort money from a victim company by demanding payment to unlock an encrypted, encrypted data or database. Uh, so the way it works is um, the threat actor will, will get a, a, a foothold into your business, typically through a phishing email, a vulnerable website, 
um, Jet had mentioned about the digital transformation applications, things going more digital, uh, portals, and um, the vulnerabilities found in anything that's internet facing or web facing uh, is also an attack vector that the, uh, the threat actors can penetrate and then install the ransomware. And the reason why ransomware is really so attractive to the criminal groups here is because the major impact that it would have on the business. So if, if you are part of the supply chain, moving goods and services back and forth, and you get interrupted for a day or a week, it has a huge impact, not only on your own business, but everyone else that is interconnected. So, so the TNL industry in particular is, 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 is very much integrated, um, and there's a lot of interdependencies upon each to make sure that they can execute upon their specific part of the supply chain. And so having any outages or interruptions for any of the businesses, you know, it, it, it creates, you know, obviously lots of problems. Um, they're also targeting, the criminal groups are targeting the TNL in particular because those companies are more likely to pay the ransom to avoid any losses that would occur, you know, due to that outage or that interruption and the impact they would have further down through the supply chain and to the end customers. So the cyber criminals are pretty crafty. Once again, they're thinking, hmm, anyone that manufactures things, any, any industry that moves goods, goods around or goods and services around, uh, we're going to go ahead and target them. And so um, that is really the biggest threat, you know, that we have seen uh, for the transportation and logistics industry. So what can you do? So um, first of all, let me hit on a couple of notable um, victims or breaches that occurred uh, in TNL in particular. And by the way, these are the two largest and most, most recent that occurred, but there are hundreds, if not thousands, that go unreported. So the major breach reports that I like to read through and keep myself sharp on what's going on and what's happening, not just to look at who the victims were, but what was the techniques that the criminal groups used to break in, um, there's, again, I said hundreds, most likely thousands, if not tens of thousands of much smaller uh, businesses that have been impacted by this and have paid the ransom. So whether your business has 25 employees <clears throat> or 25,000 employees, um, unfortunately, transportation logistics are being targeted. So back to FedEx. So they were, um, they were purchasing TNT, which is a sub subsidiary. Uh, TNT got, um, co got compromised. And uh, it has been very well documented that uh, TNT, and hence the, the parent, FedEx, wound up costing them about $300 million in lost business, uh, retribution that had to pay, so on and so forth. And there was an additional $75 million of integration costs for FedEx to, uh, to integrate the TNT subsidiary. So, you know, very, very painful, and FedEx obviously is, you know, a household name uh, to everybody. Maersk, who, um, for us, we are certainly familiar with them, you know, other Americans may not be, but Maersk was uh, really a, a poster child of how this all went wrong, and they actually suffered $300 million in business losses. They saw a 20% drop in shipping volume. Uh, this is all during the time when they had to rebuild, rebuild from the ground up, 50,000 workstations, servers, and applications over a period of 10 days. I think the numbers were something like 42,000 workstations, 4,000 servers, you know, a couple hundred applications. But, you know, this, this was just a disaster, you know, for Maersk. So what can you do, you know, as we're wrapping it up here? So strong recommendation is if you have not had a security assessment performed in the last 12 months or year or two or three, uh, then it's even worse. Then you really should consider hiring a third party to perform a security assessment. And that security assessment should have extra emphasis on ransomware vulnerabilities, such as the ability to detect and thwart phishing attacks, um, taking a good look at any Internet-facing applications or portals that you have, and ensuring that uh, there's no vulnerabilities in there. Um, um, so I was mentioning threats earlier. You know, a, a, a risk doesn't occur unless there's threat, there's threat actors out there. Um, vulnerabilities exist, and so if a threat can take advantage of a vulnerability, that's where you have the risk. And as I mentioned, it's impossible to have zero vulnerabilities uh, within a business, but you want to be able to really ensure yourself and your customers that you've done everything in your power to, to do all the right things 
um, that's practical, feasible, and affordable. So a risk assessment, a security assessment, is the best first step uh, to see where you stand. And then most likely there will be some findings from that, which then will require some uh, mitigation and remediation activities. Um, I had mentioned phishing a couple of times during this, during this portion here. Uh, make sure you institute regular security training for your employees. It sounds so fundamental and so simple, but absolutely it's a must-do. There is some free computer-based training that's out there that you can get. You can also you know, find yourself a third-party vendor that sells this. It's relatively inexpensive, but highly recommend employee training, especially the executives and those that are able to, to push money around. Um, so you could have some financial fraud, but for ransomware, it's everybody. They could go to the lowest common denominator and impact that machine, and then the whole business can go down. All right. And then finally, you should regularly test and validate uh, the backup and restore that you've got built for your business. And Maersk was a perfect example. So if they had properly designed a backup and restore, then they would not have had to rebuild from scratch 50,000 servers and applications. So this is really key is on a daily basis, your business should back up all of its daily activities. And so if ransomware does hit, um, the FBI and other law enforcement always recommend don't pay the ransom. Rather, now implement your backup and restore. And if it's done correctly, you will actually hardly be impacted, right? Your backup and restore might be a two-hour or a four-hour SLA, but then you're in business and you don't have to pay any ransom. Unfortunately for Maersk, that was not the case. So that's a couple of uh, notable victims. There's a couple of things you can do. Um, again, risk assessment, security assessment, make sure you train your employees and make sure that you're back up and restore work properly. And I think we have a polling question, please. Emily? All right, our third polling question. Does your business have a dedicated resource for cybersecurity? And your options are yes, we have a chief information security officer or director level resource in charge. Yes, we have a manager level in charge. No, our business is not large enough to require dedicated resources or I don't know. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. Uh, we will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. And let's go ahead and take a look at what everyone had to say. Mark, back to you. Yeah, just to wrap it up, everybody, so great. About uh, almost 30%, yeah, so about a third and a third and a third. So. So those that have a CISO or a director level, excellent. A manager, excellent. And for those of you that do not, maybe you think your business is too small, but I would still recommend somebody from your IT organization um, take on the role of being, you know, if not part-time, then try to transition somebody into a full-time cybersecurity, um, you know, person or responsible person. Um, need to make sure that the fundamentals are in place, as I mentioned. Um, significantly can reduce the risk of ransomware or other types of um, breaches occurring uh, just by implementing some practical and fundamental steps. Uh, so hopefully that was, uh, that was um, educational for everybody. And at this point, we're going to hand it over to Jesse Proctor to talk about some new revenue recognition guidance. Jesse? Mark, thank you for uh, sharing those insights on cybersecurity and how that growing impact uh, is impacting the supply chain in our in our industry and the transportation logistics part of that supply chain. Really appreciate that. Um, we're now going to shift gears and discuss changes that are going to be impacting your financial statement reporting. And back in May 2014, the Financial Accounting Standards Board issued an update to replace existing guidance on revenue recognition. And I share the historical date here to help underscore the, I guess, the complexities and the significance of this change because it's, it's something that began a long time ago that, you know, we're here in 2019 and we're talking about this, this change that has taken quite a while to, to be fully implemented and to be fully processed. And so this is, a big, this is a big change that was done and it was made because of the wide diversity in practice that was existing in industry, the industry or even within the same industry on how revenue was being determined and recognized. Uh, the new standard creates a new principle-based revenue recognition framework uh, that we're going to talk about here shortly. This new revenue recognition guidance was effective for public companies with fiscal years beginning uh, after December 15, 2017, 
um, or uh, during 2018 for your calendar year uh, companies. And then all other companies are going to be effective for fiscal years beginning after December 15, 2018 or 2019. So this will be full effect here during 2019 for all business entities. And the guidance is generally a shift from a risk-based model to a control-based model um, based upon the completion of distinct performance obligations. Um, and this essentially just results in revenue either being recognized at a point in time or over in time, over time, depending on the completion of the performance obligations or the transfer of that control. In addition to the shift in the way to recognize and to process uh, revenue, that also requires a much more robust and comprehensive disclosure in the notes to the financial statements to provide more transparency about the nature, the timing, and amount, and the uncertainty of revenues and cash flows from um, your customers. So as I mentioned previously, the new standard created a new principle-based revenue recognition framework that each contract with a customer or a group of similar contracts will be assessed based upon a five-step model in order to determine the amount and the timing of revenue to be recognized. While there are only five steps, it would likely take the entire amount of this time allocated for our webcast to fully cover the nuances, the complexities of each step, and how they apply to each, uh, each client and each industry specifically. But we would be happy to work with you more on navigating that. But for today, we're just going to introduce you to the five steps and provide some quick, brief descriptions and some quick examples so step one is identify the contract with the customer. And a contract here is just to provide a quick context of what this means, because I feel like the first feedback we get from our clients when we approach them with this is that they have no contracts with customers. And so to determine what a contract is, um, both parties have to be have approved the contract, have to have enforceable rights, have to have payment terms that are identified, and have to have commercial substance, and collectability has to be reasonably uh, assured. So a quick example, uh, may be a master service agreement. Uh, it, in some instances, it may constitute a contract, uh, or in un other instances, it may not. An example of when it may not is if the contract lacks any type of uh, enforceable rights um, and only provides maybe outline the terms that, of which the uh, two parties will navigate. In that case, there would be no, it would lack the uh, commercial substance and it wouldn't be deemed a contract. But in other cases, a uh, master service agreement may uh, constitute to the contract if uh, the agreement requires you know, minimum amounts of activity or there's clauses within the agreement uh, that uh, provide kind of substantial penalties to terminate that agreement. In that case, it likely would constitute a contract because there is what they would call commercial substance. Um, in instances in which you have an agreement or a contract that can be terminated by either party up until uh, uh, that wouldn't, there's no contract there until in that case you take a load and you sign the bill of lading. And so at the end of the day, there's still a contract, whether it's a big formal contract that spans several loads or each individual load being moved and tendered uh, would still constitute that contract. Step two is identifying the performance obligations. Companies will need to identify promises within a contract to determine if they are distinct. Distinct is defined uh, as a promise or good that the customer is capable of benefiting from on their own, or they have resources available to, uh, to, be able to be able to use that. And it is distinct within the context of the contract. And so this is a contract by contract or group of contract based uh, assessment that is done. There is a portion of this though that if, uh, if the context of the contract is demonstrating that you're providing a combined output or combined service, then you would that some of the separate identified performance obligations would be deemed to be inputs into this. And so an example of this uh, criteria would be a promises could be loading and unloading services, promises to haul a load from point A to point B, providing warehousing services, paying tolls, or purchasing fuels um, on behalf of the customers for a move. Uh, these promises would need to be evaluated to see if they are uh, separate and distinct. Generally, if payments for the tolls or the purchases of fuels are being charged back to the customer, uh, these would be considered the input to an overall combined output of hauling the load from point A to point B. But for services such as loading or unloading and warehousing, these may have to be assessed to see if they are a distinct um, within the context of the contract. 
and will take analysis by management. Step three is determine the transaction price, and this is the amount of consideration to which an entity would expect to be entitled to in exchange for that good or service that's promised. Quick examples of what could go into the transaction price would be the revenue related to miles based on an agreed upon rate per mile, fuel surcharges, tolls, and other accessorial fees. Then you go to step four, which is to allocate the transaction price to the various performance obligations. And then this price is allocated based either on a relative standalone selling price basis, which the best evidence of this would be the observable price that you're charging uh, your customers for that service. And then lastly, you recognize revenue in step five. And a company would, uh, this is recognized either as it transfers the control of the promised goods or service, um, and this can occur either at a point in time or it can occur over time. Control is considered to be transferred over time if the customer receives and consumes the benefits of the, com the, the performance obligation at the same time. This means the company would uh, not need to substantially reperform the services already performed. Um, and what I mean by that is, for example, is if a carrier was hauling a load from point A to point C, but they stopped at point B, and enough, for some reason and another carrier had to finish hauling that load to conclude, because the service would not need to be reperformed from point A to point B, then in this scenario, the revenue would be recognized over time. Because of the, this overtime criteria that's, implement, that's being proposed here, transportation companies uh, will generally recognize revenue at overtime as opposed at a point in time, such as maybe when it was done at delivery or upon shipment in the past. Companies will need to evaluate the overtime or in-transit revenue using a couple different options the best, that best depicts the pattern in which the control is being transferred. Some examples of these uh, measures would be to record revenue based on hours to complete, uh, miles completed to date, or days completed to date for a particular load as is compared to the total amount that's required. Whatever method you use to measure this needs to be applied to consistently to all uh, similar contracts. So we have, this is just, I would compare this implementation to this new standard is, you know, your revenue is the backbone of your, of your organization. In the same way, if you were to buy a new warehouse management system, a new transportation management system, a new accounting software system, you're going to go through a process to implement that. And that process is going to involve understanding the, how it's going to change the current existing processes and understanding the nuances of what's going to take in order to become confident with the impact and how it's going to go on a go-forward basis. You wouldn't just go through and install your new ERP system or new warehouse management system without doing tests or checks along the way. And this is a very similar situation where you're changing, you know, it may not be a physical software or a physical uh, system that's being changed. It's more of a, but it's going to change the way you approach those processes. And we can have the advantage to look at lessons we've learned from the public transportation companies that, that have already adopted this new standard. And through that process, what we've learned is the implementation is a significant component of the standard. You can't just switch to the standard. There's take time to evaluate the contracts, understand it, and implement it to ensure that you are able to understand the fully the impact of these. And then once that has been done, they've disclosed that in general, the results of this change in the revenue standard didn't have a material impact on their financial statements, but they still had to go through correct the implementation process to make that conclusion. And even though they may not have had a material impact, in general, in most all uh, transportation companies, there was a, an associated adjustment that was done at the beginning of the period and the end of the period related to that overtime or in-transit revenue, which we talked about, Earlier, So even though they may not have uh, materially impacted the financial statements, there was an adjustment that was made. There was a significant amount of work that was done to understand the implementation of the new standard. And they've also had to figure out ways to make sure they're capturing the appropriate data for the financial statement disclosure requirements. I recommend uh, a couple disclosures. Uh, Warner Enterprises, that's who I've looked at, XPO, 
they've uh, issued their financial statements and they have great examples as to how they address kind of the warehousing and the non, uh, the 3PL type aspects and then Warner having a truckload perspective of how they go about that. And I think now we have a polling question, Emily. All right, our final polling question. How prepared are you to comply with the revenue recognition guidance? Totally prepared, some more prepared, not prepared at all, or I don't know. And once you have completed all CPE requirements today, you'll be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress widget to the right of the slide view. Give everybody a couple more seconds to make a selection. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. All right, it looks like we have the majority of the people who know about it, they're working their way towards it, either at some, at some phase, and uh, some that um, we can help you with. We can, we can help reach out to me afterwards, and we can work through it. But I think now I'll transfer over to Jennifer. Thank you, Jesse. We are coming up on the top of the hour here, so I'm just going to hit, uh, hit the high points on state and local tax developments. Probably the most significant development is the June 2018 United States Supreme Court decision in South Dakota versus Wayfair, which overturned well over 30 years of um, precedent. Uh, the bottom line is that many remote sellers, probably including a lot of your suppliers, are now required to collect sales taxes on their invoices when they would not have been required to collect sales taxes before. Most of um, analyst and practitioner focus on the Wayfair issue so far has been on the retailers and helping them determine how to best comply, but this does impact transportation and logistics uh, companies as well. They, transportation and logistics generally don't have to collect sales taxes on their sales to their customers, but they do pay sales taxes on certain purchases. Uh, all industries face this, but it's particularly complex for transportation and logistics companies, I think. Uh, by nature of your business, you're operating in multiple states, which means that you're subject to just a real patchwork um, of uh, varying state laws that often conflict with each other. Um, we talk about fragmentation in the last mile delivery business. Well, there's a lot of fragmentation in state and local taxes. The exact same item might be taxable in one state and exempt in another. Um, Dunnage, I think, is a pretty good example. Dunnage is it's taxable in Washington, but I believe it's exempt in Alabama. And then, of course, there are all the states in between. So the action step here is to, uh, now that many of your suppliers are going to be uh, required to collect sales taxes, you are going to have an additional burden of uh, an opportunity to review your purchasing processes and perform an analysis of what you purchase and where you use it to determine what states would tax a particular item and in what states it's exempt, and then be able to communicate with your suppliers and issue them the documentation they need so that your exempt purchases are not taxed. And it's important to be a little bit proactive on this just so that your um, uh, procurement uh, process stays as efficient as possible and you aren't paying sales tax taxes where you don't need to. The flip side of this, if your purchasing um, process uh, involves accruing and remitting use taxes on purchases, you want to review those systems to make sure that you're not automatically um, collecting or remitting use taxes on invoices where now your suppliers are charging you sales tax. Uh, we're coming up pretty close to 11 o'clock, so I'm going to skip over a couple of slides and um, come to the wrap-up here. Um, local taxes and market sourcing economic performance are very important, but um, sort of a big picture view is transaction readiness. Uh, if you perform an in-house due diligence study, if you're contemplating um, 
a transaction in the future or or there is one being planned right now, uh, performing an in-house due diligence study can uh, uncover some exposures and allow you to identify some mitigations on your schedule rather than a, a buyer's compressed time schedule and maybe even find some opportunities for refunds. Uh, and another a very important point is to consider sales taxes when you're preparing for a transaction so that your transaction structure, again, since by virtue of a transportation and logistics business, you are operating in multiple states. Um, if state taxes aren't considered at the front end, they can end up, depending on how the transaction is structured, they can end up taking a fairly large bite out of the proceeds or gain at the end. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Emily. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to Jesse, Mark, Jet, and Mark for your presentations today. Uh, we are right up at the top of the hour, so unfortunately we will not have time for questions. However, if you do have questions for our presenters, you may still enter those in the Q&A window, um, or you may reach out to any of them directly. Their information is in the speaker bios widget to the left of the slide view. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time. <laughs>